are in week two of Love in the 80s, and I will explain kind of the connection in a moment. It's a series on finances. I know that's the favorite topic. People flock to series when you talk about giving and saving and Right? I mean, hey, that just like really gets your heart. Okay, it doesn't get heartstrings. I'm going to be real blunt. We're going to deal with some facts. We're going to deal with some hard numbers. We're going to talk about some truths that are not as exciting or heart wrenching or, oh, warm fuzzies are not going to come. It's like I had a guy last week on his way out. He's like, Whew. I'm like, what? He's like, that was physically painful. <laughs> We are talking about putting God first in finances, and, and honestly, anything before me is a painful discussion. I mean, we don't like having something before me, and so I want to start out with just a kind of a fun survey to help, because we all tend to be in one of the categories, either savers or spenders. Here's the best way to determine, because I mean, some of you are like, well, I saved. I, I like to save the dollar, you know. All right, when you get extra money... That wasn't expected. I want to show of hands. Uh, how many of you, first instinct is to save it? A lot of hands down. When you get extra money now that you didn't expect, your first in instinct is to spend it. Yeah, there's a lot of spenders. Eh? That's a natural. I, I, I tend to, I'm like, oh, what? And, and I'm married to a saver. And so she's like, what are you thinking? And I'm like, why aren't you thinking? And, and we go back and forth, and it just doesn't make sense. You know, uh, last week we had the awkward discussion on putting God first. See, everything kind of flows when you put God first rather than the stuff of this world and me, myself, and what I'm going to get next and, and the pride and the selfishness that comes out of that. And, and this week, we're going to talk about saving. I know it's a little less awkward, but it's still one that needs to be discussed. Why? 75% of Americans are stressed out in their personal finances. Hey, and when it comes down to it, as I talk to couples sometimes when they're struggling, when they come in, it's either faith, it's sex, or it's finances. Those are kind of the big three that get in the middle and, and, and starts to divide homes. I mean, there are so many who struggle. And, you know, 61% of Americans are living paycheck to paycheck. And I, I know some of you are going, but can you just kind of take a back seat here, preacher? I mean, you're a preacher. We're supposed to be reaching the lost, right? And and we're talking about money, and we kind of, what? We shared this last week. There are over 2,000 verses on money and possessions in the Bible, while there are a few hundred on prayer. There are a few hundred on faith. There are a few hundred on love. Thousands on money and possessions. Because when it comes down to it, where we put our money, our heart just follows right along after. And and it's something we have to fight and deal with. So 88% of Americans have less than 10,000. Now, some of you are going, hey, some people have 10,000? And Yes. And, and it's actually a very healthy thing to have money set aside for emergencies. 88% have less than. And that's not that big of an emergency or a savings account. 55% of Americans have less than 1,000. Now, here's the thing. Do you realize one in three people, if you look down the row, will have zero to less than $100, basically, basically zero emergency funds or savings set aside for a bad day? 30-some percent in this room, if the statistics hold true, don't even have $100 that they wouldn't have to go to credit. That's a scary thing. Now you go, okay, okay, thanks for making me feel guilty. You know why that's so important is peace actually comes out of doing things God's way. And, and it is stressful to live that way. It is causing pain. It is causing division. And here's the thing. God wants the best for you. And this is an area we struggle, so he talks about it a lot. And so we're going to as well. You know, uh, Let's just compare from a how we look in the world. Personal savings rates, we're about 30 
and country-wise down the list from the top. You got South Korea at the top, who on an average put away 33.5% of their income for a rainy day for saving for future. You got South Africa, and we would rather look down than we would up. Um, they're like only 0.5%. And then we're pretty near the bottom at 3.4. Now that includes those who are putting away stuff like billionaires like Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and all those. And so this is a serious thing. We don't have to live that way. God wants you to be freed up so that your money is not controlling you, but you're controlling your money. See, it's simply a tool. I know some people think, well, yeah, he's going to tell us now money is the root of all evil. No, I'm not. Money is a wonderful tool, but it's just a tool. You're misquoting the Bible when you say that. It's the love of money is a real root. There's nothing wrong with money. It's just when you start to love it, it's not meant to be love. And so I want to start out with just kind of a, uh, let's bring it back down. You're like, okay, now you're just kind of stomped on me, made me feel guilty. Thanks a lot. Let's bring a little levity. I'm going to go to a place for some great teaching, probably a place you would not expect me to go. Hey, let me share a little Saturday Night Live with you. Hey, don't buy it. Okay. Along with a 12-month subscription to Stop Buying Stuff magazine. So order today. Oh, so many problems could be avoided if we just understood this simple principle. If you don't have the money, don't buy it. And yet we constantly just put out that credit card. We go a little further in debt. We take out another loan. Then we, it just continues. And then we wonder why we have this huge burden on our shoulders and we're not able to help others when we want to help. We're not able to plan for the future. We're not able to relax and live this picture that it's talked about in Scripture. You know, his principles actually work. God's principles actually work. Doing life his way is not our way, but our way is a mess and his way is good. Whether that's morals, whether that's their finances, whether that's priorities, whether it just doesn't matter what the topic, doing it his way works. Now, uh, some of you are just like, well, you know, I, I, life's pretty good. I'm doing all right. I got my first job and, and you haven't seen much life yet. It didn't really have to go back, but just a few years to 2020 when everything fell apart, anybody had a job during that, you're like, whoa. And you go back 15 years. You've seen huge swings in recession and all kinds of problems and economy and gas prices all over the place and <sighs> ups and downs and cycles in this world happen. And God has a different way of doing things, of saving today and planning for tomorrow where tomorrow doesn't have to be so stressful. And we're going to learn from a guy who really put this into practice. His name is Joseph. And if you want to talk about a guy who had a rough start to life, it was Joseph. I mean, all kinds of things went wrong. I mean, he led the Egyptian empire. And you're like, well, that doesn't sound like, now wait a second, you don't know how he got there. He led the Egyptian empire out of an economic crisis or a hurricane with a simple principle of saving today to prepare for tomorrow. So let me give you a little summary of Joseph's life. And it's found back in the Old Testament in Genesis, but his brothers did not like him. He was daddy's favorite, and they just got sick of him. And, and so they not only got sick of him, but they end up kidnapping him, some brothers. And, and they, you think your brother's bad? These brothers are the worst. And they sold him as a slave and then told dad, uh, I'm sorry, he got killed by a wild beast. He's dead. And, and now he's off in Egypt. And then not only now is he sold off as a slave, he gets trumped up charges against him that get him thrown into jail. They were unjust. They were lies. And now he's rotting in jail. Doesn't sound like a very good start to life. Well, Pharaoh, Egyptian's leader at the time, has this just scary dream that he's not sure what it means. He's upset. He's worried. This other guy who had been in jail at one point with 
Joseph tells him about Joseph saying, hey, there's this dude who's really close to God and he helped me. Maybe he could help you. Well, the Pharaoh had a dream about seven big, fat, healthy cows getting eaten by seven scrawny cows, cannibalism here by cows. And, and he's like, what is going on? And he said, he doesn't know what to think of it. Joseph ends up explaining the dream, saying, you're going to have seven years of success, followed by seven years of famine. And, and then he tells him how to plan and prepare for it. And Pharaoh was so excited and appreciative of what he does, he lets him out of jail, puts him in this position only second to Pharaoh to plan and lead the efforts on how to prepare for the seven years of bad. Joseph just puts into some basic, simple plans, save today to plan for tomorrow, principles from the Bible that is just simple but are so hard for us to do. So let me pick up the story here in Genesis chapter 41 and verse 33. Therefore, Pharaoh should find an intelligent, wise man, put him in charge of the entire land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh should appoint supervisors over the land, let them collect one-fifth of all the crops during the seven good years. Have them gather all the food produced in the good years that are just ahead and bring it to Pharaoh's storehouses, savings. Store it away, guard it so there will be food in the cities. That way there will be enough to eat when the seven years of famine come to the land of Egypt. Otherwise, this famine will destroy the land. Now I'm going to jump down. Verse 47 says, as predicted, for seven years the land produced bumper crops during those years. Joseph gathered all the crops grown in Egypt and stored the grain from the surrounding fields in the cities. Now, Joseph put into place a 20% mandatory savings across the nation. That's radical, but it was also wise. So I'm going to give just a couple of simple principles that we all know we just need to be reminded of. See, financial teaching often is not new stuff. It's just being reminded of what we're ignoring. And so first principle, when you're making money, save some. Pretty simple. When you're making money, save some. It, it, the temptation is, I'm making money, spend it. Making money, spend it. And he's like, no, 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 no. While you're making money, save some. And so he's like, Pharaoh, all right, bumper crops, everything's going good, save, save. He's like, no, no, we don't want to spend, spend. No, no, save, save. And that's what I want to tell you to know. If you have a job, you're doing okay, things are going all right, save some. You know, the personal economy that you're going to live out in this world is not any different from the national economy. It's going to go through good, then it's going to go through bad. It's going to go through good, it's going to go through bad. If you are in this crazy idea that you're going to live in la-la land and everything's going to be happy and unicorns and rainbows and lollipops for the rest of your life, that's a fairy tale. It's not going to happen. Just like the whole world, it's going to go through ups and downs, and you need to plan for that. And so inevitably hard times will occur in everybody's life. That's part of this world. And so here's a simple plan we introduced last week, something my dad taught me as a little kid. It's not a hard and fast rule, but it's just the 10, 10, 80. This is a great starting place. Please, please let me just drive this home. This is a starting place. It's not the end place. I hope that you save more than 10%. I hope that you get to the point you're giving more than 10%. But that's all this is, is you start with God being the giver of everything. So you give 10%, you start with him, you put that in order, start to do life his way, you spend less, and then you save 10%, planning for the future, and then you live on 80. And how we love the 80s. Do you finally get the theme? That's for those who are new. We love the 80s. This is my part. This is what I get to do. And everything is a gift of God. Now, I know, I know that when you start bringing up amounts, people get uncomfortable. And when you get uncomfortable, almost always the attitude is the problem, not the amount. If your attitude is right, the amount is never a problem. 
You don't have a problem saving. You don't have a problem of giving if the attitude is right. We have a problem with the giving and we have a problem with the saving when the attitude isn't right. And so before you start arguing with your spouse or before you start arguing with me after service, check your attitude because the attitude is the problem, not the amount. Let me go on. You're like, that's getting uncomfortable. All right, verse 49. He piled up huge amounts of grain like sand on the seashore. Finally, he stopped keeping records because there was too much to measure. Bumper crops, great economy. Joseph started storm prep. What a solid principle. If you think of just the last five years, you know, back in 2020, that 3.4, which is the normal that Americans are saving on average, went to like 16 and a half. Now, you're like, whoa, yeah, because we were stuck at home. That was part of it. And, and we couldn't spend money. And so we were all stuck at home. And a lot of money went back. And people were afraid because they didn't know about tomorrow. I mean, crisis was a real thing that we all were looking at. The problem is, is we forget because the next year, it went right back to normal. Spin, spin, spin. The next year, spin, spin, spin. We're just continuing to go back. And we ignore that whole idea where we just max out rather than living within means and planning for the invariably bad day tomorrow. Here's a verse that just changes things. I, I do not like being called a fool. I don't think anybody likes being called foolish. God is not real PC. I mean, Proverbs 21, 20 says, fools spend whatever they get. Hear me, if you're doing well, just learn from Joseph, save some, lower your debts, because everyone is going to face an economic storm. You know, Money Magazine um, says that every 10 years, 78% of people will go through a financial crisis of some sort, where there's medical expense, unemployment, death, divorce, something like that, that could devastate their finances if they haven't saved and prepared for it. 78% of us every 10 years. So let's go back to Joseph. Because here's the thing. God wants better for you. I want better for you than that. I am so thankful for a dad who taught me to save and taught me to give. And a wife who values this right along with me. We don't argue about finances. Early on in marriage, let me just tell you. We actually put a rule in place that we don't spend more than 50 bucks without talking to the other person about it. I don't go buy jeans. You're like, your jeans, those cheap Wranglers cost, no, they didn't cost 50 bucks. But I was going to buy three pairs, so that put me over. And, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, we don't spend it without talking about it. I want to be accountable, and she's accountable because we're partners in this. So let's go back to Joseph, verse 53. At last, seven years of bumper crops throughout the land of Egypt came to an end. Invariably, bad times are going to come. Verse 54, then the seven years of famine came. And just as Joseph had predicted, the famine also struck all the surrounding countries. But throughout Egypt, there was plenty of food. Eventually, however, the famine spread throughout the land of Egypt as well. And when the people cried out to Pharaoh for food, he told them, go to Joseph and do whatever he tells you. So with severe famine everywhere, Joseph opened up the storehouses and distributed grain to the Egyptians for the famine was severe throughout the land of Egypt. And people from all around came to Egypt to buy grain from Joseph because the famine was severe throughout the world. Next principle, and this may sound like a no-brainer, but it actually is important, is when you need your savings, now it's time to use it. Let me emphasize when you need, not just want, savings aren't there just so you can spend it. It's when you need it, this is, that's what the purpose is. Whether it's for the emergency, whether it's for, you know, uh, uh, planning for retirement, that's when it's now time. And I know some of you go, well, of course, that you have savings. No, there are a lot of people. Studies have shown that once they get the security blanket, they don't ever want to spend it. You know, Scripture says, uh, take a lesson from, you, from the ants, you lazy bones. Learn from their ways and become wise. Though they have no prince or governor or ruler to make them work, they labor hard all summer. They gather food for the winter. Well, ants are great savers in the summer. They work really hard. They put it away, and then they consume it in the winter, and then they work really hard in the summer, and they put it away, and then they consume it in the winter. They don't get stressed about work, and they don't get stressed about 
using their storehouse. If the ants can work the plan and the plan works, maybe we could work the plan and have the plan work. See, savings is absolutely necessary because storms are going to come. I so wish that I could tell you, you have a happily ever after. And you do in heaven. Here on earth, Jesus said, in this world, you will have trouble. That's just a promise. That's part of this world. And I hate it. And Satan uses it to discourage. He tears people down. He gets them falling apart. He has marriages that struggle. Parents and kids struggle. People just fall apart. They get into addiction because they're not sure how to get out of the trap. And Satan laughs. You have no control over whether storms will come. You do have control over whether you prepare for the storm. So prepare. You make a decision as Pharaoh did. You save for tomorrow. And you know the beautiful thing about it? Not only did this protect his people, protect his country, protect his family, it actually protected others as well. You see that constantly in the way of God. He blesses you so that you can bless others. It says in Genesis 41, verse 57, and people from all around came because they were hungry and needed help. Joseph didn't just take care of himself, he helped others. God always moves his followers to compassion. God always moves. That's just the rest of the story. We see that in Joseph. We see that in the New Testament as well. Here is a third principle. When you see a real need, be generous. When you see a real need, be generous. You know, I had a great discussion with my small group on Thursday night. We were talking about it, and we all want to be generous, but one of the things was like, oh, it's hard to know who to help sometimes or where to help. And I, I want to help, but I want it to be a real, I don't want to enable. And there's a truth to that. That's one of the principles I think God encourages and gets this example that we did last week in, in Acts chapter four, where they brought it to the church. They brought it to the leaders and the leaders helped distribute it to those who were really in need. And there's this principle of not being in control that just lays it out that I think comes into play here. You know, I love having a wonderful church leadership. I trust. I mean, we have volunteers from all kinds of background that help plan and figure out where to send and how to do. I trust our elders. I love our group. I trust our missions team. I trust our benevolence team. And so I know when I give, you know the cool thing? When I give sacrificially here, I know that I'm helping people right here in Manhattan who really need the help. I'm helping ministry with youth and children. I'm helping benevolence for those who are struggling. I'm helping those who are in crisis. And it's not only here, but it's around the nation and around the world. This is one of the more generous churches. So I just want to challenge you to think about it. That's a great opportunity. The elders put, as I joked last week, got a lot of people's attention. I said, it's not a very sexy way to give when you talk about reducing principle because people get excited about paying for the, the new building or building the new thing or the children's wing. Principle? Ugh, that's not so fun. But I'm thankful that the guys want to bring down that debt because when you bring down that debt, it frees up ministry for kids. It frees up more for missions. It frees up more to go to people. And so that's what their heart is. So you might consider that. That's a great way just to think about the heart of God is always to understand we are blessed to be a blessing. So that Ephesians chapter 4, simple. It says all the believers are united in heart and mind. They had this, this idea that we don't own our stuff. God does. So they shared everything they had. Verse 34, it says, because they saved, they had compassion, they shared with others, there were no needy people among them. Because those who owned land or houses would sell them and bring the money to the apostles to give to those in need. I mean, if you just stopped and said, okay, God, how do you want me to manage what you've given? Think of the peace that could come into your home, into your relationships, Think instead of laying up at night going, how are we going to make the bills and the arguments that could come? You could actually rejoice in who could we bless and what can we do? Think of the mind shift that occurs when you do that. You know, there is a wonderful tool that we've made available for the church and started out with just a generous guy in the church that paid for the first year and then we've continued to do it since because he believed in it so much and it's called Ramsey Plus. You know, you guys can get on as anybody as members uh, of the church, anybody who's a part that calls this home, 
um, you can get on. We got it right in the outline. We got the connection, how you can get in. It's on the front page of the app as well. Just a, you, you got teaching videos. You got all kinds of apps. You got all kinds of information that could help you get control of your finances. A lot of you are going to struggle with a principle, though. You think, well, yeah, I'll need that once I get a promotion. Once I make a little more money, once I get a little bit further down, no, you need it now. Whatever phase you're in, because here's the thing, the, the, the day of by and by never comes along and changes your actions. What you don't do today, you won't do tomorrow. The more you have, the harder it gets, not easier. When you can't tithe on $100, it gets a lot harder when you get to $100,000 because we start to hold tighter. And so here's the truth there. There's an article in there that I linked in your account, I mean, in the uh, um, sermon notes. I want to encourage you to read. It's too long for me to quote. But he wrote a wonderful quote, and he just talks on this idea. He says, you will only save money when it becomes an emotional priority. I'm like, whoa. That's such a good, because you can do whatever is a priority you're going to do. If you have a kid who's going to die, if you don't get a money saved up in nine months for a surgery, you'll do what it takes because it's an emotional priority. And so get things in line with what God says and it just changed things. Warren Buffett says, do not save what is left after spending, but spend what is left after saving. See, I, I want to close with just this idea because I know some of you are still struggling. Okay, why are we talking so much about this? It's because I want the best for you. This is a spiritual issue. Do you realize to the Jew who would have read and heard about how you handle finances and for Paul, the disciples, for Jesus, they didn't compartmental, they didn't have a word for spiritual because life was spiritual. That's an American mindset that this is spiritual and this is not. Everything for the Jew was spiritual. Their life, their marriage, their job, their everything. There was no compartment. You did not have Sunday, God, and then over here, go do my stuff. Everything was God. So let me ask you to comp not compartmentalize, but just ask you to prayerfully consider in what area of your life should you stop spending so you could save more? I want you to think about that this week. Think about it today because it's about your freedom in Christ that I'm hoping for. And I promise you, the view is a lot better once you start doing it. God, I just thank you for each person here. And I'm so thankful that you've allowed us to have a, a wonderful church we can trust and we can be a part of. And God, I'm thankful for our leadership. I'm thankful for those who determine where the missions dollars go. I'm thankful for our children's, our youth. Uh, I'm thankful for all the different ministries. And God, I ask that you would help us to just move forward where our individuals within this church make you truly Lord of their life and that their pocketbook wouldn't be their Lord. God, I don't want to worship money. I want to worship you only. So God, it's in the wonderful name of Jesus we come before you. Amen.